Luke chapter 24. Verse 1, we're going to read a couple verses here just to give us the framework of why we're here today. I hope we're all, you know, recognize and realize why we're here, but let's just turn to the Word of God to see why we're here. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared that they were some women who loved God some women of God ladies that were hungry for Jesus they gave their life to Jesus in service of him to to pursue after him and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb but when they entered they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ while they were perplexed about this behold two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing and as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground the men said to them why do you seek the living amongst the dead he is not here but he has risen yeah Jesus, we thank you that you're alive forevermore. We thank you that you're for us. And if you're for us, who can stand against us? We thank you that your love was demonstrated in this, that while we were still sinners, you gave your life for us. And Lord, I pray that we would walk in the power of the resurrection. Reveal to us the sound that you have released from heaven. I pray that today in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen before you're seated tell seven people I hear an echo I hear an echo tell seven I hear an echo it's the number of completion well happy resurrection Sunday Easter Sunday however you want to say it yeah come on yeah I'll tell you what if you're excited about that give Jesus the loudest shout the loudest praise that you could possibly muster up Come on, I didn't even have to encourage you to do it again. You did it the first time. Come on. That just threw me off a little bit. Usually I got to say, we can do better than that. No, but man, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Man, we appreciate all of you. We're so grateful that you're here today. And if you're a guest with us in-house or tuning in online, man, we want you to know that we love you appreciate you and that we prayed for God to bring you uh, right here uh, today and so you're here by God's design even if you think your mom tricked you into coming or your spouse bugged you to get here God may have used that but God had a plan for you to be right here right now in this moment yeah to hear this word that he's he's prepared for us today and and hopefully I just deliver it the way he needs it to be delivered amen I'm always praying, Lord, help me to to decrease so that you can increase, so that your anointing goes forth. How many of you realize that it's the anointing of Jesus that breaks the yoke, that brings freedom? Come on. And uh, yeah, awesome. Cool. You guys ready? All right. So help me announce the title of our message today. You ready? Echo of the empty tomb. One more time. Echo of the empty tomb. Tell your neighbor, I hear a sound. I hear a sound. I hear a sound. We're going to try to set this thing up so that it comes to life for you today. So God reveals it today. <clears throat> now, now, I got to be honest. I got to be honest. When I was preparing this message and I started to work through the message, I actually wanted to title it something different. I wanted to title it, We're Not Screwed. Like, I, <laughs> I really did. Like, I did. I did, but I thought, well, that might be a little racy for some people. So I'll behave, but I couldn't just help myself. I, <laughs> I had to let the cow out the bag. I had somebody one time say, man, you stand up there and say whatever, don't you? I'm like, hey, listen, my sins are forgiven, man. I- I've been set free. <laughs> Past, present, and future, Jesus is so good to me. You know, like, no, but <clears throat> I decided we would keep echo of the empty tomb because <clears throat> I'm going to repeat that a lot today. So I thought, <laughs> we might not want to repeat that a whole lot. So... <clears throat> But, but, I, but, but for real, man, I love this concept, by the way, echo of the empty tomb. 
And the Lord gave it to us last Easter. Matter of fact, it was, it was the Monday after Easter Sunday. We were sitting in our morning meeting. And, and if you remember at that time, the pandemic was roaring and, and we didn't know what was happening. Churches weren't meeting. We weren't gathering and, and all those different things. There was a lot of uncertainty and unsettling in our spirits. And, and we were sitting back in, in my office and talking just about, okay, Lord, what, what do you want to do? And, and Jonathan was like, he said, man, pastor, I really believe that, that the Lord wants us to do something based off of this this phrase or this idea this concept the the echo of the empty tomb speaking about how the the resurrection of jesus still speaks to us and for us today and so let's 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 do that and and man i I gotta admit to you man my spirit leapt inside of me See, see the bible says this that the holy spirit himself will testify to our spirit when something is from god so that we can discern what is being thrown at us and who is around us and, and what's going on and, and all those different things. And so, man, his spirit testified to my spirit and the Holy Spirit testified to both of our spirits. I had the Holy Ghost goosebumps all over me. The fire of God started to well up inside of my heart. And I was like, let's go. Then had to wait a year. <laughs> I was like, can I try to figure out how to do it sooner? Um, but now we did it. We waited a year uh, but let me just say this uh, really quickly, but, but it wasn't until just a couple months ago that we really honed in on writing that song, Echo of the Empty Tomb. It was just a couple months ago, and I'll tell you, man, Brent and all the team did an awesome job, didn't they? Yeah. <clears throat> man, we really appreciate everybody that collaborated with us on, on that project. So proud of everybody who had a hand in that, and God is good, and And man, so look, go check it out. You just heard it here, but go check it out. It's anywhere you can stream music. And uh, yeah, man, because we believe this, that God gave it to us to bless, to bless you and to encourage you. Amen. That Jesus is, is alive forevermore. And because he is alive, you can be alive. You can have life and life more abundantly. And so, yeah, we are so blessed to be able to, to do that. Now, before we, we, we hop into the, to the heart of the message, to the, and to the brunt of it, I just want to, to give you the, the definition of the word echo, okay? This, this word echo. And the great Marion Webster, praise the Lord, describes echo in two different ways, two different meanings they, they, they give for this, this word echo. One is to repeat or to reverberate after the original sound has finished, right? Got sound effects. <laughs> I got sound effects. We're high tech around here. I'm just, you had no idea, did you? <clears throat> but that's what it means, to, to reverberate after the original sound has already finished. It just keeps going and going and going and going. The second is to be reminiscent of or to have shared characteristics with. Yeah. I knew you guys would like that. Pretty proud of myself right now. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, let me get back to the message. To be reminiscent of or to have shared characteristics with. And so I want you just to store that back in your memory banks for a moment because we're going to circle back around to that and hopefully in Jesus name we'll tie it all together and you'll leave out of here with something really good I pray in Jesus name yeah but we're going to come back back to it in in just a moment but as I was studying and and praying for this message it it got me me thinking which is a scary thought in and of itself but it did get me thinking and I started to think how we as Christians, we, we like to spend a lot of time just focusing on one aspect of God. And in relating to this subject today, we, we, we like to, to, to focus on the aspect of the cross. We like to talk a whole lot about the cross. Now, I'll give you a real quick story. Okay, I have this, this guy, right? He always comes up to me and wants to talk to me about the cross, right? All the time, like, like, pastor, it's all about the cross, man. Without the cross, we would be lost. Can I get an amen? And I'm like, well, you can get an A woman because that's a thing now. You know what I mean? Like, no. <laughs> but <clears throat> I'm like, I can't give you the full amen because, but this is what he says. He's like, it's all about the cross. It's all about the cross. It's all about the cross. Over and over. Our freedom is found in the cross. 
Our victory is found at the cross. Our hope is found at the cross. And, and look, man, I get it. I get what he's saying. However, it's not the full picture. That's only half of the story. Hear me. The cross and the resurrection are inseparable. You can't take one without the other. And they're not competing against one another. They're perfectly complementing one another. The cross and the, resu and the resurrection. And, and, you know, and I start thinking, right, like, yeah, as Christians, we like to do that, man. We like to hone in on one specific aspect of God and focus on that one as aspect of God. And maybe, look, maybe it's because of our finite minds and, and our lack of sight and maybe because we compartmentalize everything in life. So we got to section it all off. And, and so maybe that's, that's the reason we, we do this. But, but I, was, I was thinking about that, right? Like, like how some of us, man, we want to focus on the grace of God and leave out the discipline of God. Failing to realize that it's the grace of God that disciplines his people. A lot of people want to just focus on salvation, not paying attention to sanctification. A lot of people want to focus on the blessing and not the process. And so we, we fix our eyes on one certain aspect. But see, God destroyed that paradigm for me years ago. And he said to me, he said, I'm not either or. I'm both and more. So, so, so I'm not just grace and discipline. I'm both. I'm not just salvation. I am sanctification. I'm both. I'm not just dead, man. I'm alive. He's not either or. He's both. He's both and more. But we spend a lot of time talking about the cross and about the, the death of Jesus. Which, by the way, hear me, hear me. We should be spending, obviously, ample amount of time. Because Romans says this in, in chapter 5, verse 8. It says that God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus dying proves to us God's love for us. It proves it. And because through his death, it proves God's love. Now I am convinced of this very thing, that not no height, nor depth, nor things present, nor things to come, no angel, no demon, no created thing in all of creation can now separate me from the love of God that I have through Christ Jesus. Nothing. Amen. This is what the death of Jesus proved to us. And it proves that no one can separate us from him. Not a single person. The cross is is an amazing, an amazing story. And we should be looking at the cross. It, it proves this love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of the Most High God. However, however, without the resurrection, the cross is just another execution. There was tons of people that got hung on a cross throughout the history of mankind a ton that was the way the romans crucified that's the way they they judged people they put them on crosses and so without the resurrection the cross would have just been simply an execution because without the resurrection hear me without it without the resurrection god would not have approved of christ's sacrifice it would have showed god's lack of approval of jesus's sacrifice See, the resurrection proved that Jesus is the Christ. It proved that he is the Messiah. It proved that he is the anointed one of God. His resurrection proved that he is the only son of the most high God. It proved that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. It proved it. And it proves that he's all we need. That he's everything that our hearts and our souls long for. Everything. That in him we live and we move and we have our being. This is what it, what it proves. And so I say all that stuff to say, man, without the resurrection, the cross, the death of Jesus would have meant nothing. Would have just been another death of some, some guy that they didn't like in Rome. But see, in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it's It's clear. Jesus did die for us, but even more than that, he was raised back to life. Come on. And is now seated at the right hand of God the Father with all power, all authority placed under his feet in heaven and on earth. 
And right now, it says this, right now he's interceding on behalf of us. Telling us God is rooting for us. He's rooting for us. Jesus is praying for us, encouraging us. And because this is is the truth, man, his resurrection is still speaking to us, for us, today, right now. Right now, because he, he died, and even more than that, he was raised back to life. His empty tomb released a sound. It released a sound, a sound of victory. A sound of of authority, the sound of power, a sound of acceptance. Because the the tomb is empty, it released the sound of forgiveness, the sound of mercy, the sound of prosperity. Now, when I say prosperity, I'm not talking only about money. I'm talking about prospering over the enemy. It released a sound. When he was raised back to life, the sound went forth and because there was a sound and the tomb is empty now it's echoing throughout all of eternity this is why something that happened over two thousand years ago is still setting the captives free is still making the blind eyes see is still restoring broken marriages is still healing and mending the brokenhearted even though it happened two thousand years ago why because it still echoes echoes throughout eternity This resurrection released a sound, guys. And the sound is still echoing throughout eternity, setting all mankind completely free, whoever will receive and believe on his name. Without the resurrection, the cross would have just been another, just another execution. And so we all come together today to celebrate the resurrection, the resurrection of King Jesus and to listen for the sound that God has released from heaven to listen to it listen for it and and I want to read with you guys just another another couple verses here is that okay we're going to read Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 and this scripture I believe with with all my heart speaks to, to directly what the Lord wants us to hear today the sound that he wants us to pick up today. And, and this is what it says. For this reason, he, the he being Jesus, by the way, had to be made like them, talking about us. So for this reason, Jesus had to be made like us, fully human in every single way. See, he's fully God and fully man. Do you know that Jesus wasn't a mutt? He wasn't 50 50 and then re you know, redefined as a designer dog to charge you more money? No, 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 no. He was 100% God and 100% man. I thought you would laugh at that. <clears throat> In order that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God, and that he might make atonement. Shout atonement. Atonement for the sins of the people. What this is specifically saying, real simply, is that Jesus came to the earth to serve God by giving atonement for our sin. That's why he did it. See, see, we, we've got to recognize that we were all sinners in need of a savior. Every single one of us. I don't care how nice you are and how sweet you are. Praise God, I'm glad you are but we're all sinners in need of a savior. This is what the Bible teaches. And so we all needed our sins atoned for. Now the Greek word there for the word atonement is heliskomai. I'm really good at this Greek thing. Heliskomai, something like that. But what what it means in the Greek, right? Translated over means completely wiped out eradicated from existence is literally what it means in the Greek. It's, it's amazing. So in other words, Jesus came to the earth to serve God on the earth by wiping out and eradicating sin once and for all for everyone who would receive and believe. 
Isaiah 53 says it a slightly different way, quite a bit different, but basically the same thing. It says this, that the will, it was the will of the father to crush the son. The son was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement that brought us peace was placed upon him. And now by his wounds, we are healed. It was the Lord's will to place upon him the sins and iniquities of the many. That's what it was saying. Same exact thing, it was God's will to have Jesus atone for our sin. John chapter one, verse 29, John the Baptist has this amazing revelation. And he sees Jesus walking towards him and he makes this declaration. He says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the entire world. Man, see, God made his son, Jesus, like us so that then Jesus could atone for us. That's the whole reason he came, to atone for your, for your sins and my sins, the sins of the many. He wouldn't have been able to atone for us if he wouldn't have become like us. He wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice if he hadn't become just like us us in every way. Do you know this is why the animal sacrifices didn't last and they weren't long term because they weren't like us. They didn't deal with the same temptations. They didn't deal with the same frustrations. They didn't deal, they don't deal with what we deal with. And so it, it couldn't last. It couldn't cover sin for all time. Jesus had to become just like us. Let me, let me, let me try to explain it to you this, this way. So it, it's really difficult a lot of times, very difficult to help people get through something if you've never been through the something. It, it's, it's just the reality. I'm not saying it cannot happen. I'm just saying it's more difficult to happen. This is why peer-to-peer -peer counseling is so effective for so many people because there's people who've already been through it. They've already walked that walk and they've already talked the talk. And so, man, I can just kind of, you know, glean from them and relate to them and they can help me get through what I'm I'm going through. This is, this is what the Bible is saying right here in Hebrews chapter two. It reiterates it in Hebrews chapter four saying this, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses for, for ours, but the, oh my, my praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Sometimes you get tied up. But one but one who has been tempted in every way that we are, except was without sin. Amazing. Jesus became exactly like us so that he could sympathize. So he could sympathize for us, so that he could atone for us. This is why Jesus is called the mighty counselor. This is why he's called the great physician, because that means no matter what he is going through, no matter what you're going through, he's already been through it. And so he can help you through it. He can walk you right through it. And because he's already been through it and conquered it, now the Bible says that you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. He become like us in, in every way, except was without sin. And that is the key phrase right there at the end. Except without sin. See, he dealt with our weaknesses. He dealt with our temptations. He dealt with our insecurities. Except he didn't allow those things to overcome him. He overcame them. He overcame the weaknesses. He overcame the temptations and the insecurities that life tried to throw at him. He overcame every one of them. Which in return, which had to happen by the way. So then in return, he became the final and acceptable high priest. With the acceptable sacrifice for the sin offering. This is what Hebrews 2 and 4 are trying to get across. He, he isn't either or, he's, he's both and more. This is what it's trying to reveal to us. And throughout the entire book of Hebrews, right, we see Jesus playing these dual roles. Not either or, both and more the high priest and the sacrifice. And one of the major themes throughout the book of, of Hebrews is that Jesus is our final high priest. 
We don't need another one. He's it. And that he had the final sacrifice, offering complete atonement for all of mankind, wiping out all sin for those who belong to him. You see, if he would have given in to the sin that so easily entangles us, if he would have given in to that stuff, couldn't have been the, the, the high priest. He couldn't have been that final and acceptable sacrifice. And there's something that I, I wanna show you here in this, in this text because something amazing is how the Old Testament is linked to the New Testament. It's actually really beautiful that the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Jesus, every bit of it. It's all pointing to Jesus. See, the Old Testament will, will show and, and give us the law. That, that's what it did. But Jesus came to fulfill it. So what the Old Testament introduces, Jesus fulfills. It's amazing. This is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, don't think that I came to abolish the Old Testament law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. It's incredible. And so the Old Testament introduces the law to us. Another way to say it is it introduces what is pleasing to God. It introduces what is acceptable to God. That's the Old Testament. And Jesus comes to fulfill it, to completely be pleasing and acceptable to God so that you and I can now be pleasing and acceptable to God when we live our lives through him. It's a beautiful thing. And see, in the book of, of Leviticus, which is the book of the law, just literally a manual, a hand guide, a handbook, whatever, to what is pleasing and acceptable to God, the whole entire book. But in Leviticus chapter 16 is, is where I wanna focus just for the next few moments that we're together. Leviticus chapter 16 is dealing with the high priest and the acceptable sacrifice. It's dealing with the day of atonement and the high priest's role on the day of atonement. See, the day of atonement was when all the people of God came and gathered, gathered together and offered up sacrifices for the sins that they committed against God. They, they all gathered to, together. And, and this all took place in the tabernacle, in the tabernacle, in the, in the house of God. Could we pull that up for me, please? So I got a picture for you. The tabernacle, I think, going once, going two times, three times. Okay, I'll move on. So the tabernacles broke up into three separate spots. You have the outer courts, the holy place, and the holy of holies, these separate, three separate things. And you see the, the tabernacle was designed by God to set amongst the people of God so that it would be a dwelling place for the people of God, for, for, for the people of God to, to spend time with God and be able to interact with God. That's what it's about. But it was separated into three separate things. Here we got it. The outer courts, which had where you would have the altar for the burnt offerings, then it would go in to the holy place, which another altar to burn incense on. And then the showbread was there, just something that the, the, that the priest could come in and eat and breaking of bread, fellowshipping with God. And the third was the holy of holies. The holy of holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was placed, representing the presence of God. But see, the holy of holies, you see them dots there? that represents, and the, and the pink thing, that represents, that pink line, represents the veil, and it separated the people of God from the presence of God. It separated them from the Ark of the Covenant. And here's the, the thing, man, this tabernacle limited the access to God that the people of God, they couldn't get in to the Lord and experience him in profound ways. And right on top of this Ark of the Covenant sat what they called the mercy seat of God. It was the mercy seat. It was where they would come and ask God for mercy, where they would come and ask God for forgiveness of their sins. And, and they would take the blood offering, their sacrifice that they did in the outer courts, they would carry it in and, and lay it on the, the mercy seat and ask God to forgive them of all their, all their sins, to atone 
for their sins. See, the tabernacle put major limitations on the people of God. Because there were certain things you had to require to get to certain levels of the tabernacle. The outer courts was only for the common people, which by the way, we would be considered common people, every one of us. We're commoners. So we would be in the outer courts in the furthest, the furthest distance away from God's presence. And we could never go any further in life, period. It wouldn't matter what you did. You couldn't get any, any closer. Then you take another step in into the holy place and then they called them common priests. Common priests. They could get into there. So it was like they got to step in just a little bit closer to the presence, the presence of God. But the high priests, which there was only 18 of them, right? Most of the time that's what they had, 18 high priests. And they could only go in there. And only one of them could go in there once a year. That's it. Only one could go in once a year to experience the presence of God. See, even though God desired to create a dwelling place for his people to meet with him, it wasn't God's fault that separated the people from him. It was their sin that separated them from God. Because hear me, something that's really lost, I think, in the churches nowadays is, listen to me, God is perfect, he's holy, and he's righteous, and he can't look upon sin whatsoever. Sin can't be nowhere near him. It cannot. This is why the people couldn't enter into the presence of God. And so then once a year, right, they gather together on this day of atonement called Yom Kippur. They would all come together. They would travel all over, meet at the tabernacle, and they would begin the, the sacrifice for the blood offering, the sin offering for their sins. And they would, they, would, they would kill a bull and a ram. The bull, the blood of the bull, was for the high priest's sin. That was what atoned for his sin. While the blood of the ram or the lamb, the blood of the ram or lamb, was meant for the sins of the people. That was the offering for the sins of the people. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everyone needs their sins atoned for. And because that is the truth, right, they would have these blood sacrifices because only blood could account for sin. Actually, the blood of the innocent covered the sin of the wicked. That's the way it was laid out. And after those sacrifices were made, the blood of those sacrifices were taken into the holy of holies by the high priest. And again, he could only go in there once a year, just one time a year. And the high priest would take in the blood of the bull for his sin offering and the blood of the ram or the lamb for the sin offering for the people. And he would take it in and he would lay it on the mercy seat of God and ask God's forgiveness of the sins of the people. And after all that took place, after every bit of that took place, guess what happened? God either accepted it or rejected it. He either accepted it or rejected it. And if he rejected it, the high priest would never come out of the Holy of Holies. He'd be struck dead in the presence of God because the sins were not atoned for. His sin in front of a perfect and righteous and holy God would completely destroy him. But if it was acceptable to God, his sacrifice, then the, the high priest would leave the Holy of Holies unscathed, unharmed. But can you just imagine, just, just for a moment, the anxiety that would have come from all this? Just, just imagine this anxiety. Because I mean, my goodness, man, we, we all know that we say things we shouldn't say probably every day. We do things we shouldn't do probably every day. And we do it all year long. Every day, all year long. And if we lived BC before Christ, we would have had to carry the shame of that sin all year long. The guilt of that sin all year long. And I don't know about anyone else, but man, that, that literally sounds absolutely terrible to me. Literally devastating to me. When I, when I find that I've, I've messed up and I've sinned against God, I can't hit my knees quick enough. I can't get on my face quick enough to, to offer up a, a prayer of repentance. So I can't even imagine what it would have been like to carry the sin all year long. And then on top of that, let's just say, let's just say for argument's sake and for allegory's sake, 
We're living back then. And we made it all year long without losing our mind or having a nervous breakdown from all the sin that was weighing us down. Let's say that happens. We finally get to the day of atonement. Guess what? Now you and I have to rely on someone else to talk to God for us. We can't even approach God at all. We can't have a conversation with God. We don't even know the the heart of God whatsoever. We got to rely on someone else, probably that we barely know, to go in and make our our sacrifice on our behalf. Offer God the offering of sin and, and pray that God accepts it. But he's not hearing my prayers. He's hearing the high priest. I, this, is, this is what they, they had to do. And let's just assume for a moment too that, that the, the, the sin offering was acceptable to God. The high priest took it in for us, laid it on the mercy seat, and he came back out completely unscathed. Let's say that happens. We'd be overwhelmed with joy. We'd be really, really excited, like, yes. But then all of a sudden, we would start to remember, wait a minute, it's only for one year? Man, I gotta, I gotta do this next year? I gotta do this whole thing over and over and over again every single year? Year after year after year and so forth and so on. Every year, I gotta do it. This is what these people had to do before Jesus in order to atone for their sins, to be in right standing before the Father. They had to do this every year, year in and year out. It only lasted, but for a moment. Now, now let me tell you what, what Jesus did for you. Let me, let me give you the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, on Good Friday, right, which we just celebrated. If you didn't make it, you missed it. But that's okay. We'll probably do it again next year, maybe. But on Good Friday, we celebrated that Jesus died for our sins. He gave his life as a living sacrifice. And what that represented when Jesus did that over 2,000 years ago, the cross represented the altar in the outer courts. That's what it represented. That's the picture that you have to see in Hebrews tying the Old Testament lamb to the New Testament lamb. The Old Testament sacrifice to the New Testament sacrifice. The cross represented the altar in the outer courts where the common people were. Where everybody could witness him being crucified. And see, instead of a bull and a ram... The sacrifice was the perfect lamb of God. The one who knew no sin became our sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. The lamb of God was slain and it proved to be better than any blood of any bull or ram. And while he was buried in the tomb, the picture is he went into the holy of holies. That he went into the mercy seat. That's why the two angels were there at the at the tomb when to witness the sacrifice that's what the cherubims were there for on the mercy seat there was there was two cherubims that would sit there and witness the sacrifice this is why the angels were there in the tomb they were witness this witnessing this acceptable sacrifice of god so he took it to the mercy seat and what's amazing to me is he didn't take the blood of someone else's sacrifice He took the blood of himself and laid it before God. God, is this acceptable and pleasing in your sight? And just like the high priest on the day of atonement, the same exact way where we would be excited if they came back out unscathed is the same thing Jesus did when he rose that day. When he came up out of the grave, It was the high priest coming out of the Holy of Holies, completely unscathed, conquering sin and death once and for all. It showed us that he was the acceptable high priest with the acceptable sin offering. It's amazing. It's literally amazing. On the third day when Jesus rose from the grave, see, the sound of atonement went forth. The sound of freedom broke free. The the sound of forgiveness was released. It, It went forth. 
when Jesus came up out of that grave. And that was God's way of saying, I approve of the high priest. I approve of the sacrifice. The debt for sin is not paid for just a year. It's paid in full. There doesn't need to be another sacrifice. There doesn't need to be another day of atonement. It already happened once and for all. That's, that's what it meant when Jesus was resurrected from the grave. I don't need any other sacrifice. It's, it's paid completely in full. And he said this, this is what all this is showing us. And because of him, because he is acceptable and he's perfect in every way and he gave his life for the many. Now it's made all of you worthy to walk into my presence, to be a people who can experience my presence wherever you are, whenever you call on my name because of what Jesus has done for you. I no longer need, God's saying, I no longer need the veil to separate it because Jesus is now the veil. He tore it completely in half and, and replaced the veil with himself. He's the veil. I'm removing all limitations from the tabernacle. I love it. Because I'm changing the tabernacle. No longer is the tabernacle some specific place. The tabernacle will be you, me, and you. You'll each be walking, talking temples of God. You will each carry my presence wherever you go. This is what it's saying to us. This is what Jesus has done for us. He is the acceptable and the final high priest with the final and acceptable sin offering on your behalf. He atoned for all sin, for all of humanity, for eternity, forever. See, BC, BC, before Christ, back in Leviticus days, their atonement lasted for one year, so the echo only sounded for one year. Just one year. But see, because of what Jesus has done, because he bled and died, and then he was raised back to life, our atonement, our forgiveness, our freedom, our victory never stops sounding off. It echoes through eternity because the, the grave is empty. Amen. See, in Luke chapter 24, these angels, right, they say, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He has risen. He has risen. This is the sound that the empty tomb released. It was done for you and for me. It released the sound when the gravestone was rolled away. When Jesus got up out of that grave. And it's still echoing today. Freedom. Freedom. Forgiveness. Forgiveness of every sin, past, present, or future. Freedom. Freedom from drug addiction and alcoholism. Freedom from homosexuality and pornography. Freedom. Freedom for everyone who will believe and receive. Freedom complete unadulterated freedom no strings attached nothing to hold you or bind you ever again this is what it's echoing it's echoing victory victory over the enemy victory over shame victory over depression victory over anxiety victory over anything that the enemy tries to throw at me I have victory in Jesus name I'm no longer a victim I'm a victor walking in complete victory. See, the empty tomb is still reverberating the original sound and it never stopped. It never stopped. And so the only question that we have today, period, will we believe it and receive it? That's the question you have to answer in your own heart before God. But here's the thing, the other meaning of the word echo, remember what it meant to be reminiscent of or to have a shared characteristic with. See, this was the whole point of why God did what he did through Jesus. He wanted you and I to become a people with shared characteristics of our Savior, of our King, a reminiscent of who he is and the sounds he releases. We are to be the people who are reminding all of humanity 
that their sins have been forgiven. See, Jesus didn't want us just to, to hear a sound and then just reverberate a sound that we read or to just talk about some sound. No, no, no. He wants us to become the sound. We can become the sound of freedom, the sound of victory. It's amazing. Our testimony speaks to the original sound. So you've got to answer the question. Do you just want to hear the echo or do you want to become the echo? Do you want to walk and talk like Jesus? Do you want to be a part of his bigger plan to help set all the captive free? To bring his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you want that or do you, do you not? That's a question that you're confronted with right here today. Because one day we'll all stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Every last one of us. And it will be recalled to us. You remember that day when it was explained to you what I did for you on the mercy seat. Do you remember that day? Yeah, I remember. Then why didn't you accept me? Why didn't you give me all of you? Will you allow him to atone for your sin? Will you start to become the echo that displays his glory and his majesty upon the earth, declaring his resurrection, that he's alive forevermore? And you can prove it. I can prove it by the way we live for him. Come on and stand to your feet, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Yeah, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would begin pulling hearts towards you right now. I pray for conviction where conviction is needed in Jesus' name. Discipline where discipline is needed. Grace where grace is needed. Mercy where mercy is needed. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would restart revealing to hearts their need for you. I pray that, Lord. Reveal to them the power of the resurrection right now in this moment. Holy Spirit, draw them in, draw them in, draw them in. Touch their hearts and their minds right now, Lord. I pray that the one that is far from you, God would come running to you right now. That God, the sin that we're all find ourselves living in, that right now in the moment, if that's our lives, that we repent and turn to you and turn away from those things, I pray. Draw your people in, Jesus. Still every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never said, Lord, I want to live for you and give you my heart. And I just want to ask you if you would like to do that. And if you do, just raise your hand right where you are. We'll, We'll pray with you and walk you through it all together. Hallelujah. Yeah, Lord, we thank you. Come on, everybody repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I ask you, Lord, to come and live in my life, to take over my life. Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead and I receive you. I give you everything. Come on in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering.